Hello, my name is Arkelia Todd and the purpose of this video is to teach God's sons and daughters to be spiritually discerning overcomers and victorious in the face of evil. The content will be taken from the book, The Brainwashing of Black America, How God Helped Me Overcome. For a copy of the book or the workbook, feel free to email me at kinsmanredeemer41 at gmail.com. This is a video series dealing with relationships that are hateful towards you, unrighteous, vile, uh, mean, everything ungodly and unrighteous. So it's to help you and your family to deal with issues that you will face. Uh, this week we're studying from the chapter 13, what is coming out of their mouths. Um, feel free to listen to the assessment question, answer it for yourself before continuing on with the lesson. Question number one. As stated in this chapter, what is a bonus for knowing God's Word? The Word of God will enable you to overcome life's tough situations. Using His Word in your life provides you with the godly wisdom you need to get through the day. Applying God's Word to a situation allows you to feel good about yourself and the choices you make. You are able to throw off the shame and guilt you felt because of someone's criticism. God's word sets you free to be you. Question number one. As stated in this chapter, what is a bonus for knowing God's words? God's word is a protective force. It is a force field against words. You have God's words and others' words. Let God's words weigh more. Question number two. How can you know what is in a person's heart? If you ever want to know what is in a person's heart, listen to what they say. I noticed that some white people are quick to make reference to what someone of color has done incorrectly. They will bring up what they think is off being with President Barack Obama or Michael Vick, a former Pro Bowl NFL quarterback with the Atlanta Falcons who was hit with a federal indictment on dark fi dog fighting charges in July 2007, or any black figure. But the first time you mention the white priest who molests children, or the men who kill their pregnant wives, they have nothing to say. And I bring those occurrences up to see what they think about them. Those actions were atrocities, but a conversation about these events is never broached. It is more often a conversation that places a black person in a negative, undesirable light. Why is their criticism so one-sided? Because they're showing you what's in their heart and the real them. Luke chapter 6 verse 45, King James Version says, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. Question number two. How can you know what is in a person's heart? What is in a person's heart comes out in the words he speaks. Do an individual's words show respect or disrespect? What is in your co-worker's heart? Question number three. What is in your co-worker's heart based on what he says? Do you hear perverse words or compassion in what is said? I was able to see what was in this guy's heart because of what he said. I was in the cafe eating breakfast when a news reporter reported on the prospect of the United States building a border fence between the United States and Mexico and putting cameras on the fence. One of the guys in the cafe mentioned that the builders should mount machine guns on top of the fence and if anyone got within 50 feet of the fence, the machine gun would spray bullets. I thought how cruel that was. What if the Mexicans were thinking, where are the machine guns when they saw the whites coming and taking their land back in the old days? The Africans probably wanted to know where the machine guns were when the e e Europeans invaded their countries many years ago. How soon people forget? Question number three. What is in your co-worker's heart based on what he says? Do you hear perverse words or compassion in what is said? Question number four. What does scripture teach the godless does to his neighbor? In that same scripture, what happens to the righteous? Scripture teaches with his mouth the godless destroys his neighbor, but through knowledge the righteous escape. Proverbs chapter 11 verse 9. Once when I had gone to swing out dance lessons, a white girl and a white guy were also taking the class, and they came and sat at my table. After a while, the girl spoke and I said, hello. We exchanged 
pleasantries. This is the same gir white girl who the week before had made a comment about my scarf. She asked some questions about what I did for a living. I made sure to ask her the same questions. I like to ask the same questions to the person who is inquiring about me to see how forthcoming he or she is with information. If, they, if there is balance with the information sharing, then maybe I will share. But if I'm the only one giving information and their primary goal is to receive information, then we have a problem. Question number four. What does scripture teach the godless does to his neighbor? In the same scripture, what happens to the righteous? Some use words to destroy you, but with godly knowledge, you escape the desired destruction. Acquire knowledge, biblical knowledge. Question number five. Do you practice asking questions to the one asking you questions? Then she made a comment about my hair. I had it in braids and the same time and the last time she saw me it was in an afro. She said my hair looked nice and wanted to know if it was all my hair or extensions. I said yes, I was purpose purposefully not specific. She didn't need to know that. She wanted to know if it took a long time to braid. I said, not too long. I was intentionally evasive. I knew where she was going. What if I asked her if those were her real breasts or if she had breast implants? What if I asked her if she had a facelift, Botox, st stomach staple, nose job, or eyes done? Would she be okay with my intrusive questions? Question number five. Do you practice asking questions to the one asking you questions? Ask questions to the one asking questions. Be just as inquisitive. God wants you strong and secure enough to ask questions. Question number six. In a conversation, are you likely to put yourself down? Do you put your blackness down? Are you okay with who you are and your actions and can you express your acceptance of yourself? She then asked if it was hard to wash. What in the world? I stayed cool, calm, and collected and said with a smile, no, soap and water go everywhere. Then she wanted to know if it took a long time to dry. I said I just let it air dry. No big deal. It seemed she was fishing for something for me to c complain about concerning my blackness, but I had no complaints. Compared to the amount of time I saved every week when I had my hair relaxed, this time it took to get braids was nothing. I didn't tell her all that which was none of her business. When she couldn't get me to put my blackness down by complaining about anything, she said I looked sleepy. The girl was fishing and fishing hard. She wanted to put me down on sly, but I saw through to her intentions, so I said I had been up and probably did look sleepy. I said how I was okay looking sleepy. No one looked perfect every day. I told her too often people put so much emphasis on the outward appearance and care very little about the soul or the spirit of a person, which is backwards. That is, this was an opportunity to teach, and that's how I handled my time with her. Question number six. In a conversation, are you likely to put yourself down? Do you put your blackness down? Are you okay with who you are and your actions, and can you express your acceptance of yourself? Listen to your words and whether you speak positively or negatively about yourself and practice improving your actions and your speech. Question number seven. Are you able to disagree when someone attempts to put their words in your mouth? Are you confident with your decision? There are times when people want to put their words in your mouth. The solution is to be cognizant of someone's influence over what you say. I was at Walmart returning some nuts. When I got to the counter, I explained to the lady that the nuts I had purchased were stale and I wanted to exchange them for another bag. She then asked, do you want me to give you your money back? I said, no, I would like another bag. I mentioned this incident so you will be confident in your decision and not let someone put their words in your mouth when you know what you want. By standing firm on your decision, you let a person realize you know you are sure of yourself. No, I don't want my money back. I just told her I want to exchange the nuts. I was well aware of her words that were not mine. Question number seven. Are you able to disagree 
When someone attempts to put their words in your mouth, are you confident with your decision? If you disagree with what is said, do you freely express your disagreement? Say no to the wrong path. Say what you mean. Correct the misunderstanding. God wants you strong enough to give directions. Question number eight. When a person paints your actions in an unfavorable light, how can you turn the tables? People use words to destroy you if you let them. It's so important to recognize when people suggest what you are doing is terrible or incorrect and it's not. The solution is to turn the tables and show them you're okay with whatever it is you are doing. I have been training a, an employee and writing down his training issues. I noticed my coworker John would make remarks about me writing down the training comments. He would say, don't do that or Arcuia is going to write it down. For one minute, I bought into his desire to bring shame on my actions and was hesitant to write the trainee's mistakes. For one minute, I felt guilty for doing my job because of John's remarks. But then I realized what was going on. He wanted me to feel in the wrong for writing down the employee's mistakes. John was using the power of suggestion to have me feel embarrassment for doing what I was supposed to do. When I realized what his intentions were and how I was reacting, the challenge was on. Question number eight. When a person paints your actions in an unfavorable light, how can you turn the tables? You turn the tables by being okay with your choice and behavior. Feel free to say, Lord have mercy, in the hearing of the negative spirit or just say, Jesus, so this complaining spirit can hear. Question number nine. When the words of the wicked produce blood, can the speech of the upright rescue them? If so, how? The next time I picked up the pad, I beat the picking up the pad, John. I brought attention to my actions before he did, which took away his power. Then when someone else said, Arcuia is going to write it down, I said, you had better believe it. I was letting him know I was okay with what I was doing. We are warned, the words of the wicked lie in wait for blood, but the speech of the upright rescue them. Proverbs chapter 12 verse 6. Question number 9. What, when the words of the wicked produce blood, can the speech of the upright rescue them? If so, how? It is time for God's upright to speak up and rescue. It is our Christian duty. Question number 10. As described in this chapter, what is a way to not be fooled by the bogus things a person says? It is always wise to commit your concern and cause to the Most High God. I was on holiday in Colorado riding my bike when some white guy yelled at me out of his car window as he passed by. His antics caught me completely off guard. I regained my composure and said, Lord, deal with him at your discretion. I didn't know why that man yelled at me or what was in his heart, but God did. Jeremiah chapter 11 verse 20 says, But, O Lord Almighty, you who judge righteously and test the heart and mind, let me see your vengeance upon them, for to you I have committed my cause. Where was my co-worker's empathy? One day, I was sitting in the cafeteria talking about the news item that was just viewed on TV. The segment was about a black man being released for prison, from prison for being in prison for 27 years for a crime he had not committed. The white guy watching the news with me questioned if the black guy had been sentenced to 27 years and only served a portion of the time or had he served the entire 27 years. My reply to him was that if the man had spent seven years in prison for a crime he had could not commit it. That was seven years too long. It was as if the white guy was trying to downplay the situation. I wondered how he would like spending just seven days in prison for a crime he didn't commit. It seemed easy to downplay prison time when it wasn't him behind bars. But put him in the same situation and I believe he would have a different perspective. This was a prime time to teach how hypocritical he was. I was to help him see the flaw in his thinking by putting him in the man's shoes. I will be ready next time. 
To not be fooled by the bogus thing a person says, one should ask for evidence of what is being said. Frank, a supervisor, came up to me one day and said, Arcuia, we may be able to transition you to Cruise 7, which has weekends off before the end of the year. Would you be interested in changing crews sooner than the normal transition? I said I was interested and would consider the move. He said he would let me know. I got excited, but knew Frank had a spirit of deception and drama. I was not going to get my hopes up or believe him until I saw evidence of what he was offering. Question number 10. As described in this chapter, what is a way to not be fooled by the bogus things a person says? God wants you confident enough to ask for evidence. Made in God's image and likeness, we should behave like our Heavenly Father. Question number 11. Are you prepared for more of the same of what a person has shown? A week later, Frank came to me and asked, are you interested in moving to your new crew sooner? We are still looking to assign someone to that work schedule. Would the move work for you? I replied, it would not work with my Thanksgiving plans. When exactly would it happen? He responded, we are still looking it over. I said, well, I don't want to waste my time considering something until you are sure it could happen. I couldn't tell for sure if the move would work until I knew when it would take place. Family, all I can see say is God makes you wise. Frank knew how excited I was about having weekends off. Why did he even approach me again with a date for me to consider without a date for me to consider? Why did he... I felt he wanted me to chase the possibility of the transfer. He wanted me to be like, what have you found out? Is the crew change going to happen? What is the latest on my move? He wanted me following him like a puppy wagging my tail with my tongue hanging out. Discernment is a wonderful thing and a gift from God. I could see right through what he was trying to do. He was offering false hope. He didn't, his offer didn't have much substance without a clear date. I remembered this guy's previous behavior. I knew what to expect and was prepared for this crew change drama. The word tells us to prepare our minds. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 13. My mind was ready for whatever tactic he planned to use. We ought to be prepared for more of the same of what a person has shown us with their behavior. 1 Kings chapter 20 verse 22 warns, Afterward, the prophet came to the king of Israel and said, Strengthen your position and see what must be done, because next spring the king of Aram will attack you again. Frank came up to me again. Arcuia, are you still interested to, in going to Cruise 7 early? I responded, Why are you asking me? The same question you asked last week and the week before that. He replied, I just want to make sure you are still interested. To which I said, you guys are full of crap. You ask me the same question but don't have a date for me to consider. It's like you are giving me a fake offer. He said, I just want to make sure you have your stuff together. To which I responded, I have my stuff together. You are the one who doesn't have your stuff together with a, with a specific date. My supervisor was saying a whole bunch of nothing. But I was determined to get the understanding scripture teaches me to get. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 5. A couple of minutes after this converse, confrontation, he had a date for me to consider. And I accepted his offer. Even though I had to deal with my enemy, God gave me provisions I needed to be victorious. 1 Kings chapter 20 verse 27 says, When the Israelites were also mustered and given provisions, they marched out to meet them. When God gives you provisions, you can march out and meet your enemy. Question number 11. Are you prepared for more of the same of what a person has shown? After a person has attacked you, prepare to experience that behavior again and ask God what to do to take a stand and fight back. Question number 12. How do you handle gossip? Gossip it's often the failure to resolve a conflict between two people and the pulling in of a third to take sides. This is a problem because the third person has no business in the conflict, but is used for comfort and validation by the one who is afraid to confront the other. I was working with my coworker Carrie. She started talking about the actions of another. If she didn't want to talk to the aircraft, he shouldn't have had 
if he didn't want to talk to the aircraft, he should have had the other co-worker to send it or give me control instead of what he did. I replied, what are you telling me? She said, I was just venting. I was thinking, do I look like I want to, you to dump this mess on me? Do I look like I want to hear your complaints? Take it to the source and do something about it because complaining isn't solving the issue. Next time, I would know what to say in a situation like this. If I didn't put a stop to this behavior, someone would be forever grumbling about others to me. I don't want that. I would encourage Carrie to talk to the person. Not confronting the person is how conflict persists. Scripture is very clear about dealing with conflict directly with the one you have a problem with. Proverbs chapter 28 verse 32. Question number 12. How do you handle gossip? Instruct the one who is complaining to go and discuss the complaint with the one he or she has the complaint with. Encourage the gossiper to have a problem-solving conversation with the gossipy. Or encourage the gossiper to accept the gossipy for who they are. Question number 13. Based on this chapter, how can you deal with a person who calls you a nigger? Earlier, I mentioned God's word will help you in the situation where someone called you a nigger. The solution I found in the, is the way the Archangel Michael dealt with the devil in the same way you can deal with the evil spirit. In Jude chapter 1 verse 9 it says, But even the Archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not dare to bring a slanderous accusation against him, but said, The Lord rebuke you. What can a person say to that? Now it's time for you to practice with your children, nieces and nephews, and any child in your family or neighborhood. Equip them with how to overcome, be overcomers and victorious in the face of evil. A rebuke from the Lord is the most powerful rebuke. God's word is a table turner. When someone says to their enemy, the Lord rebuke you, they have just turned the table. Question number 13. Based on this chapter, how can you deal with a person who calls you a nigger? Practice with me, pronounce, the Lord rebuke you. Question number 14 and the final question. With your present workplace conflict, what has God instructed you to do? I put in action what scripture had taught me. I had dealt with Wade, a co-worker, several times about his comments regarding my hair. When I had it in an afro, he would comment that I looked like the mod squad. This day, I had it in two cornrows going around the side of my head, and he said, I see you have your hair tamed today. I responded, wait, that is not what I'm trying to do. I went home and wondered how I should have handled the situation. I heard in my spirit to say to him, it's my hair, what's it to you? I was sorry that I would have to wait until the next time he said something about my hair to deal with him. In my spirit, I heard, you don't have to wait. Confront him when you see him. I confronted Wade early like God had taught Moses to do with Pharaoh. As I rode to work that morning, I practiced what I would say. And who did I see when I walked into the office? Now, Wade did not work in my area. And I don't know if I had ever seen him there before. I took his presence as a sign from God that it was time to confront him. So I said to Wade, Wade, before you get started, it's my hair. What's it to you? He said, oh, Q, that's how we roll here. Wade was making light of what had happened. Later, I thought, that's the problem. I felt so relieved after I dealt with him. God was setting me free from the shame Wade wanted to make me feel because of how I styled my hair. What was in his heart was coming out through his words. Do you not believe Matthew chapter 12, verse 34, which says, you brood of vipers. How can you who are evil say anything good? For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. He wasn't fooling me. The word of God has shown me what is in a person's heart will come out in what he says. Question number 14 and the final question for this week. With your present workplace conflict, what has God instructed you to do? For life's answers, commit your situation to the Most High God to be victorious over what would defeat you without him. Commit your situation to God and obey his instructions. 
to be set free from shame, discard, disrespect, and humiliation. And we're going to end in prayer. Heavenly Father, O oh, Sovereign Lord, how we thank you for this study of how to overcome in the face of evil. I don't know if the word racism is ever written in your holy word, but I know evil, unrighteousness, vow, uh, those kind of treatments are. And so we commit our cause to you and what is going on in our lives that is wrong. We ask you to help us to be spiritually discerning, which is not carnal and of this world, but a spirit connection with you that shows us what is right and wrong and how to overcome it based on what you will have us do and say and think. And we thank you for the power you bestow in us. And we will read your word to show that we do want wisdom to live this life. In Jesus' name, amen. Until next time, establish a relationship with the Heavenly Father to help you overcome whatever is going on.